Right? Yeah. Shalom and welcome to Practical Spirituality here in the old city of Jerusalem at Eshet Torah overlooking the Temple Mount. Today's class, we're going to discuss the dichotomy between spirituality and religion or the conflict between them. Uh, when people think of someone religious, they think of someone following lots of rules generally, uh, someone who's a bit uptight uh, about things, you know, they're, they're, they're generally thought of dog as dogmatic. Um, they're, they're also thought of as uh, pretty much prejudice, if you want to look at it that way. I mean, can you get more prejudiced than thinking anyone who doesn't believe the way you do is going to hell? Okay. <laughs> I mean, I know we don't normally call that prejudice. We just call it religion. But the... <laughs> But, but it's prejudice, you know, like, uh, just, it's not a nice thought to be having about your fellow citizens, you know, and they, and so these are things people think about in religion. There are people who are a little kinder about religion, like saying, well, it must have been one day something good. <laughs> That's like, meaning once upon a time religion was, was, you know, offering something that it certainly is not offering today. And so that's the nicest comments you get, you know, that, that, that it must, it must have been one day good, but now it like got all messed up and, and so now it's bad. And then there's, of course, uh, spirituality. Spirituality, on the other hand, and, and if, if you look at the word, it's kind of an interesting word that it spells the word spirit and it spells the word ritual. And if you're from Texas, it also spells the word y'all. <laughs> so, so, spirit. Boy, you guys are a good crowd today. Mm -hmm. So, anyway, spirit ritual is, it's got the word spirit, as I said there, and it's got the word ritual spirit, and it's got the word ritual, and I'm not telling that joke again. And the, and the word spirit has to do with, uh, it's, a, it's a Latin word, it has to do with lung, uh, air in the lungs. Spirit means air in the lungs. Is that clear? Spirit in the, like, like you run. So a lot of air in your lungs, so you'll per spire, and if you pass out, they'll put on you a respire. You'll respire, get those air, the air back in your lungs, and and if they fail, you will expire, expire and you're gonna die. And they even use the word expire when you see the Swiss Alps. You inspire. You know, that's the word inspire. So that's the word spirit, and it's quite amazing the word because it it doesn't have any physicality to it which is really cool. I mean, Aaron Lungs do, but not you being inspired or feeling spirit. I mean, how do you video that? You know, if someone does video that, we're going to, if we can video it, we're going to drug test you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for those who just tuned in. That was a joke before I pressed record. Now, the, um, <laughs> anyway, so s spirit is, spirit is, you can't video this stuff. But you feel it, and then you got to wonder if it's real or imagined or whatever. But but it's but that's spirit, and and we know it exists because you know there's things that we know exist that there's no way to define them. Like for example, love. No one ever will argue there's no such thing as love. Yet no one can define it. Has no dictionary definition at all. Never been defined properly. Never will be, and nor will the. Interestingly. Spirit's also going to be really difficult to define, and God, undefinable. Think about it. If you had a definition of God, you're automatically wrong. Why? Because if it's an infinite being, so you, and you gave it a finite definition, so it's got to be outside the box of whatever you think it is. So therefore, anything you think God is, he's not. I mean, he may include that, but you're definitely like, you're staring at the wrong box right now when you're talking about an infinite being. Infinite being can't be in any con conceptual defined anything. But leave it to religion to define God. This is why I have a series of classes, which I've been avoiding lately, which is called God Hates Religion. Now, anyway, spirit means, spirit means air in the lungs. Ritual, can you video ritual? You bet you can video ritual. No matter what someone's doing ritually, it will show up in space and time. It's something tangible, you can see it. Okay, that's ritual. Spirit ritual means that someone's involved with a ritual that's infused with spirit. So someone who's a spiritual person is living a, in, a they're living spirit-infused ritual. Mm -hmm. So you can almost say that the Buddhists, where the ideal Buddhist, 
would be that, you know, people often say synonym that Buddhism, you know, when they think spirituality, they think Buddhism, you know, which is a very millennial left-wing egalitarian spiritual <laughs> thing to say, you know, like, like, let's see you go to India and get your, get your, you know, you know, let's see a female go become a monk and see what they put her through. You know, like, it's such a joke. It's, it's, al it's almost as big a joke as, as left-wing liberal feminists fighting for Islam and, and Islamic refugees moving into her bedroom. I'm sorry, neighborhood. And the, the, you know, it's just not going to go well, okay? And nor will it go well for you to go to India and expect, you know, it's all, you know, I don't know what, it's Starbucks or something, you know, it's, uh, you, you know, you just can do Facebook from the ashram, you know, a little snapshot of you doing a headstand, you know. <laughs> you're gonna be, you'll, be, you'll be carrying water for the yogi for the first half a year, you know, just because you're a female. And that, that's, that'll be your first half a year over there. And, and it's, it's just not this la-di-da left-wing narrative at all. You know, it's none of that stuff. And by the way, you're, you're, I'm left-wing. <laughs> I just, I sound like I'm not, but I am just without all that stuff. It, meaning most, most political uh, perspective, I'm way more on the left than I would ever be on the right. Um, but I sound right because right likes structure and it likes to hold on to things that have worked till now. You know, they like that stuff. And that's not such a bad thing to like stuff that's worked till now. Do we have to destroy everything? Always? And the answer is no. But coming from a Jewish perspective, you're obviously going to have both spectrums down. A lot, a lot of individual rights. In Judaism, a lot of individual rights. I mean, you can do whatever you want, basically. And on the right side is plenty of structure, because we've got, we've got, we're 12 tribes, you know, there's 613 commandments, and we're aligning to the positive ones, we're avoiding the negative ones, staying out of, you know, dissonance, spiritual dissonance with like, you know, like things like pork cause spiritual dis dissonance. Okay, but, but other than that, you know, and the truth is no one's watching you. No one's like after you to make sure you're not eating pork. You know, it's like free. Do what you, do what you want. You know, go, go eat whatever you want to eat. Okay, the, you want to align with structure? Torah will tell you, you know, what's, what's going to be helpful spiritually. We have a new term, by the way, spiritually productive behavior. My wife just, <laughs> my wife's been using that lately. So, like, she, her new thing is, like, if you're thinking of doing something, just ask yourself, is this going to be spiritually productive? Or is this going to be not spiritually productive? So just like, make that the question. Uh, let's all try that over the next like two days till we get back together on Sunday. We'll spend like 48 hours of just like asking ourselves, is this like spirit, is what I'm about to say spiritually productive or is this like not spiritually productive? It's really kind of a nice thing to, the way to think of things. How do you know? If it's spiritually productive? I'm not answering that right now. Okay, that's gonna be a too long an answer. Anyway, so with spiritual, spirit and ritual, from now on, when you meet someone who's all about drop, dotting their eyes and crossing their T's, which I didn't either. <laughs> anyway, the guys who are dotting their eyes and cross, crossing their T's and doing everything ritualistically right, but there's no spirit. Don't call that guy spiritual, and don't pretend you are. Don't call yourself a spiritual person if you're just some kind of rigid whatever, you know, like, like just, and there's symptomatics of the, spirit, of the ritual people. They're usually more judgmental. You know, they usually are casting all kinds of judgment on people, and they're not enough, and they're not enough, and they're not enough, no one's doing enough. And, and, you know, I pity the fool who has someone like that as a parent. And double pity the fool who has two parents like that. Now, anyway, those are the ritual people. And then there's spirit people. Spirit people are also not very spiritual. They are spirit. So, meaning, remember how I, we spoke about before that, like, people have this scenario like Buddhism, spirituality, and everything. So, <laughs> they're not spirituality. They're spirit. 
Because if you could meditate 24 seven, if you could just somehow reduce all food intake, you know, besides just keeping your body alive and, and all drink intake, if you could just get rid of that and also renounce all interaction with work, you know, like no more work, but you rather you're cared for by the monastery, you know, the, the, the Buddhist monastery, the ashram takes care of you. So you've like really eliminated ritual from your life. Because work is a ritual. You do something good every day, people will pay you for that. Now you do something well every day. It's, you can video that stuff. And people will pay you for that kind of ritual. And they, we got a lot of other rituals. Going to gyms, a ritual, you're not going to get paid for that. And you're going to pay for that. So anyway, we got a lot of rituals. One of them is working. You go make it to the top of spirituality in Buddhism, man. You're, there's no ritual. So don't call that person spiritual. And don't call that tradition spiritual. Call it spirit. Not to mention being celibate. I mean, that's easy. <laughs> like anyone married knows the number one challenge in their life is their spouse. You know, everyone knows that. And, and it's so funny, all you single people in here are all like, so lonely and just can't wait to get married. You know? And all the people married are just like, oh, what the hell is wrong with you? you know? <laughs> but yet you're all like desperate to get married because deep down... When you, when you get to the real core truth, that's your challenge. Marriage is your challenge. That's going to be the make or break. You know, us rabbis, we don't really celebrate weddings. No offense if we're at your wedding. <laughs> Making brachas. You know. Because <laughs> we don't care that much about weddings. Rabbis care about anniversaries. All you need to get married is a pulse. A lot of money. <laughs> Anniversaries are the real stuff. Someone who can get an anniversary. Someone who can get anniversary. I know about getting married. Get an anniversary. Let's start calling it get an anniversary. If you can get anniversary every year, just every year, which means you're going to go through hell, but you're going to get anniversary every year, it's going to be you're going to really become someone. Well, the Buddhists, who are the spiritual people, they skip that. Okay? So don't call anyone spiritual if they've skipped the ritual of marriage. Because that's, a, that's an intense one. And it comes with lots and do's and don'ts. And they, and they shift if you're the husband. Your do's and don'ts are shifting. <laughs> you have to keep an eye on the do's and the don'ts because what was a do yesterday is a don't today and what was a don't yesterday could be a do today and you just don't know what to do and so it's like you better be on your toes you know throughout, the, throughout that 50 years of your life <laughs> so like don't tell me about spirituality if you're not married you know, that, that's just not happening. You got spirit going real well. Like, ladies, I'm sure you're going to have an amazing davening at the Kotel. It's going to be very spirit, you know. And, and I'm sure there's ritual, too, because you're probably saying Shimon Answer and everything, which is a ritual, and I can video your lips moving. But let's see you be married and be spiritual. You know, that's a different story. And don't forget, when you get married, something else might happen. Children. <laughs> and you got to feed those kids, which means someone's going to be making some money. Which means you gotta go out of your little sanctuary, kiss that mezuzah, which the mezuzah represents your inner, the inner order of life, shed, die, that it's enough, meaning it's the limiter. And because in your home, you're in charge of what you have in there. That's your sanctuary. You leave your home and go to work. Well, there's other rules out there, and there are not a lot of them, but it's a different game out there. And it's not your home, and it's not the sanctuary you made. And it's, I be, believe me, it's no synagogue out there. Yeah. And, and for you to be spiritual after that, and notice how Torah just totally wants us aligned spiritually, because think about it. Just to get married, you have, I, I can mention right now, six tractates, I think. You got um, Gittin, you got, you got to know how to get out to get in. You got Gittin, you got Kedushin, you got Sota, you got Yavamos, you got um, you got Kasuvas, you got Nadarim. Uh, what else we got over there? Hurrius. What? Hurrius. In is that in Nashim? Hurrius? Nita. Nita. Yeah, don't forget. <laughs> don't forget Nita. So you got that's already eight masectas, eight masectas. That's like that's like 
boom of like Talmudic law, which you know, one page of that, you know, one page of that will clean out every last gram of THC from your brain. <laughs> just trying to under, just trying to understand that is gonna like, you know, you're 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 healed from like years of partying, and the. And that's, that's like eight tractates we just like nailed right there. Oh, but then something happened. What happened? Kids. Well, kids, if there's kids, I got to make a living. So, hey, there's a kid now. If I have a kid, I got to go make some money and pay for that kid. And so when I go pay for that kid, I'm in business. So I'm out there in the business world. Oh, that's not very spiritual, says the Buddhist. The business world. And also, I got to... I gotta house them. Well, that ain't spiritual. Houses cost a lot. You know, to get a three bedroom in a uh, four bedroom in sorry three bedroom in Jerusalem. You know how much that runs? It, in dollars, a three bedroom in Jerusalem is I think somewhere between eight hundred to a million dollars. A three bedroom. You know, I mean that you're not in New Jersey anymore. You know. Eight hundred a million dollars. Like, gee, that's gonna be really spiritual paying for that, you know. And <laughs> that's not gonna be spiritual paying for that. And and not to mention the paying your mortgage every month. Whoa, you need a, it's quite a job to do that. Which means you're out there. Well, guess what? Here come the bubbas. Here come the bubbas. Who are the bubbas? You guys know who the bubbas are. The bubbas are Bubba Kama. Bubba Mitzia and Bubba Basra. Bubba Basra's real estate law because people get in a lot of issues there. That's why you have to have a lawyer sign that document when you buy a home. Because there's a lot of issues with buying homes. And so you got the Bubba's covering that. Which means God's saying Judaism's spiritual because you're going to be in the ritual of buying homes and you got to know how to deal with those things because it ain't spiritual being in an argument over real estate. I'll tell you that. That ain't spiritual. And we got a Torah, Bubba Basra, the third tractate of the Bubbas, that tells you how to deal with those things so you don't kill each other. Because you go in front of three great Torah scholars, you both give your sides, they open up the Bubba Basra, and they figure out who wins, who loses, or you, but everyone wins. Because in Torah, everyone's a winner. Even if you didn't get what you wanted, because it's Torah, that's your spirituality. And okay, you're $50,000 short of what you could have had. Well, if you're a spiritual person, you know that people spend $50,000 all the time and wind up knocked off the guardrail and wind up at the bottom of some canyon to be found two weeks later. And they're just trying to determine was it the impact or the starvation. Do you want to fight over the $50,000 or maybe let it go? <coughs> maybe let it go because God says so. Because those bubbas, I promise you, aren't rabbis making up stuff. They're clicking on the Torah and it's taking them to a website that's called the Oral Law. And only because of the Roman bastards, we had to write it down. It shouldn't even be written, really. But it's directly from the Torah. It's from prophecy of how to connect to God when you're dealing with home, buying homes. And the other bubbas are everything that's going to happen in business. That's all that's everything going on in business. Like tangible like interactions where thing, there's discrepancies and they're happening all the time. See, we thought when we see courts of law, we don't think spirituality. Like no one's thinking spirituality at your local civil court or the Supreme Court of the U.S., no one's thinking s spirituality. Because we're just so brainwashed for separating church and state that, that, that spirituality could never have anything to do with business. And that is just, that is just wrong. That is just wrong in the to your, I mean, I hope, I've, have I expressed this, have I been articulating this well, that I think everyone in this room gets that you're never going to be spiritual if you don't get this part of life clear. If you don't have this part of life clarified, that you're, you're a joker if you think you're spiritual. Because there's nothing spiritual about all those problems people get into. Anyone could go up to some mountaintop and say, Om all day. 
Anyone can hang out in a yoga studio all day. But let's see you, let's see you be married and have kids. What an iceberg commandment. You ever thought of what an iceberg commandment that is? The first commandment of the Torah is be fruitful and multiply, right? You know why God made that the first commandment? He figured when you'd see that one, you'd keep reading. Now, looks like fun. Be fruitful and multiply. Who wouldn't want to do that? So people don't realize that underneath the ocean surface of that cute little iceberg is a 10,000 meter mountain of ice. It just keeps going. Icebergs don't float. They're all the way down to the earth. I mean, some float. I'm not going to get into global warming, but, they, but they're supposed to be connected down below to the earth. They're gigantic mountains that might just peek out the top. And why did God give us that commandment? <laughs> I mean, who wouldn't say that God's about spirituality and the Torah, which, which the commandment's found in the Torah, that that's not about spirituality? Because guess what? If you follow the very first commandment in the Torah, you're not going to be living a very spiritual life. You're going to be behind the eight ball all the time. You're going to be always working. You're going to be like a, uh, you're going to be a, a hamster on a treadmill. And uh, I don't think anyone would argue that God is supposed to be spirituality. And I don't think anyone would argue that the Torah, the Bible, is supposed to be about spirituality. Yet the very first commandment removes all possibility for spirituality. It makes it a challenge that's for some, for most people in the world, would be considered insurmountable. And it is insurmountable if the Torah didn't continue on, but it does continue on, and it tells you what to do. It gives you instructions for how to maintain spirituality while in business, maintain spirituality while buying a home, maintain spirituality while married. And raising children. And what's spiritual about changing a dirty diaper? These are, these are, <sighs> I'm a little excited today, I see. <laughs> I'm like the most unpredictable teacher. <laughs> you just never know what you're going to get. <laughs> <laughs> the funny thing is I'm really good at laughing at myself so I know it's not supposed to happen right in the middle of the intensity but I just couldn't keep it going another minute <laughs> but it was fun while it lasted no I need a toothpick I, I didn't eat I, sometimes I don't eat because I'm very spiritual <laughs> but I often skip meals you should try it by the way it's amazing to skip meals again I'm not on like trying to argue back for spirit I'm not but but just don't eat so much, you know? Just stay away from food for a while. And um, meaning only till you get a healthy relationship to it. But like, just get it out of your, get out of your, get food out of your system. We're gonna be bringing buckets. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> get food out of your system. Just divorce food for, divorce food for like a week. And it's so amazing to reset everything of how you deal with things. So what do I mean by divorce food for a week? What I mean is juice, eat apples. You're feeling really empty in the drink. Eat a banana. You know, you feel like you gotta have meat. Have a piece of chicken. With, have a piece of chicken with nothing else other than the piece of chicken if you need some meat. But stay and eat till you've had the meat and then get away from food. Like just don't eat it. Unless you got to. And reset your relationship with the stuff. I mean, you, we spend so much time in food. So much time. So much, so much involved with food. And there's a lot of money involved. A lot of preparation. A lot of business involved. It's a gigantic trillion dollar business. Zillion dollar business. The, it's a giant thing. And it's just like, if you're that involved in it. So what if you took a walk away from it? For a couple days to a week. Just to like reconfigure your relationship with food. I mean, it's just a, such an important part of life. So you should be resensitizing yourself to it. And uh, especially for emotional leaders, my goodness. I mean, anyone who's an emotional leader must re, just re-relate to it by backing out for a little while and then, and then 
kind of reimmersing yourself to the subject of eating. And, and it's so much better for you. And your body works so nicely and your immune system goes f totally up. Like you, you just, you don't have to get sick anymore. And, and you, you're full of energy. And anyway, all this came from my toothpick. Because <laughs> I realized I was, I was leaving my house today at 3.30 <laughs> that not even a morsel of food had entered my mouth. And so I realized, mm, food time. But uh, I was kind of running. So we have a box, my wife creates a box and inside the box are, are, well, she doesn't create the box. She creates power balls. Power balls are, you know, like, you know what power balls are? They're like, I mean, we, I'm, I'm happy to send you our recipe. I send it all over the world, but it's, whatever, it's just little food balls. It's, if you write on the box, you know what you'd write? Food. It's just like generic food. And it's on a date basis and, you know, date, so trees, date basis. And, and you, uh, I mean, it's got all the stuff you'd ever, ever, ever need. Never goes bad. Doesn't need refrigeration. I found, I found those things in my bag from like 10 months ago. And I'm just like, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> and they taste exactly as fresh as when they were made. They're, they're, they're eternal. And, and, they're per and it's all the best foods, you know, like chia seed. That's what's in my teeth. That's what I'm talking about. Because the problem with chia seeds is they get caught in your teeth and then start expanding. So, not exactly what a teacher should be chewing on before class, but that was all I had. And thank God my daughter didn't eat her apple slices, which was, which was perfect. And she's, as I was eating her apple slices, she was like, I was wondering who was going to eat my apple slices. <laughs> she was so happy it was her father. Can you imagine if I was your father? <laughs> that would be crazy. <laughs> I personally think my kids got a great deal. I think they got a great deal. Now, I'm not sure my wife thinks that way. And her eyes bars are always going up, going like, what now? I mean, once in a while, she lets me have it. And, I, and, then I, and then I say to her, like, I say to her, listen, I spend my entire life, hours and hours a day, picking up the pieces of n the normal people. Meaning, meaning, you know the whole, like, being normal. You know that whole disease? Like, be normal. You know? Be normal. You're not being normal. You know? Just act normal. You know, and, and this really hits the observant community. Like, this whole normal thing. It's almost like idolatry. Like, the being normal. Have you ever met a normal family? I mean, show me a normal family. Like, are you the normal one in your family? Like, like, where are the normal ones? You know, I've ne I don't think I've ever met a normal person. But, like, you get these whole families where it's like, be normal. So I get to pick up the pieces of all the normal people. <laughs> you know? so, 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 to me, not normal is the new normal. <laughs> it's refreshing. My kids seem to be having a blast. They're all totally committed in their Judaism. Way more than the kids there. Way more than their counterparts. I mean, my kids are in outreach in their, in their Yiddish sems and yeshivas. It's like my kids are outreach professionals. Reaching out to these poor kids who've been pushed around by the normal situation. You know, be normal. <laughs> so, so normal's lame. Normal's lame. And it, and it creates a lot of fallout. There's a lot of casualties, a lot of hurt, hurt souls from the normal business. And, and, and it'd be fine if there was such a thing as normal, but there's nothing normal. You know, there's just nothing normal. And, and you know what I get? I get parents asking me to meet their kid. You know, obviously, because their kid's not normal. So, <laughs> so I meet the kid. And, but that's just like the beginning of finding what's not normal in that family. Like, I'm meeting, the, like, this, this kid's the doorway to the not normal and, and then I find out what's really not normal, and usually it's the parenting. That's, that's not okay. It's very normal, but it's not okay. And the, anyway, so, so, normal's no good. And, and I, and I'm, I'm really, I'm really interested, really, really interested, just to bring this full circle, I'm really interested in Torah. And I'm really interested in mitzvahs. And I'm really 
more interested than all of that or really via that, but I'm interested via Torah and mitzvahs, I'm really interested in God. Like, that's what I'm interested in. And as a Jew, I know my only path to God will be Torah and mitzvahs. Like, I'm not, I'm not one of these jokers, you know, who, who think like, you know, like, all you have to do is just be really into something, you know, like, classical music, artwork, fine wine, you know, or maybe you're really into high tech, or you're really into windsurfing, or you're really into, <laughs> you know, like, whatever, you know, like, but that's what people think, is they just have to be into that, but if you got a Jewish soul, you know, you're going to need to be plugged in Jewishly, but why am I talking about all this? I believe that's normal. That's the normal. Normal is Torah and mitzvahs and connecting to God. Like, that's the part that's normal. And all the other fixings, all the icing, all the garnish on the side of that, once you start calling that the normal, what happens is generally the meat and potatoes fade in, in their importance. Meaning the main thing, which is the normal thing, which is relating to God through Torah and mitzvahs. That's normal. That's like, that's the way to go. I'm into that. But, uh, but I, I am getting a little tired of picking up the pieces. And, and the sad thing is, is I'm having trouble duplicating myself because the, the intuition, and the, the intuition necessary to help a kid who's been badly hurt is, is not, it's not easy to come by. And, and so, and so it's like the problem's getting bigger, but the healers aren't getting more populated. We're not getting more populated people to help. We're just getting more people hurting. And so, um, so all I can do in my classes is just offer a couple things every day. And today's takeaway, I think should be that no more normal. No more normal. Torah mitzvahs are normal. All the other things is pure. Listen, Cameron, I'm gonna give you. I'm gonna give you a what to do. All the other stuff is called self-expression. Self-expression. Because you'll notice the normals usually in conflict with self-expression. You get that? You see how the normal was in conflict with self-expression. And parents almost like are almost paranoid that you're going to be too self-expressed in the world. And, and, and don't worry, you'll be a parent too, wondering about that too. I mean, we, who doesn't want to look good in, in society? But that looking good in society is a killer. And, and that same looking good in society could literally be your children's undoing. Because think about it. A parent who wants to look good for society, what message is that giving the child? Think about that. A parent who's interested in looking good in the community, in society, neighborhood, the, the synagogue, or whatever. The parent who wants to look good for society. What is the message to the child? Does anyone know what the message is? Externalities. Okay, externalities. Any other messages? Society is more important than they are. Okay, society is more important than they are. Very powerful. What else? What's the message? Okay, approval comes externally, not internally. Okay, what else? These are all pretty negative messages. What else? There's no real life. Mm, directed a little more. I know what you're talking about. Okay. What do you mean by looking good for everybody else? What do you mean it's no real life? You're living their lives in a way. I mean, you don't have your own life. You have whatever's going to look good for them. Okay, good. I like that. You don't really have a real life. What else? What, kids specifically, you're saying, you guys are saying more generically what's the problem with looking good. Not an individual. What? Not an individual. No, for the kids. What's the problem for the kids? Lack of real cash to find mitzvahs. Lack of what? Real cash to find mitzvahs. Yeah, it could be that too, that the kids are getting a negative thing about torn mitzvahs because it's not about torn mitzvahs, it's about making everyone believe you're committed to torn mitzvahs. 
Do you hear that? Wait, let's go there. Hold that. Don't forget it. You hear what we're saying? That, that it can become that everyone should believe we're really into Torah mitzvahs. And you should know. I mean, I'm not going to go into graphic detail, but some of the most heinous things I've ever heard, you know, really horrible, like, like my ears are on fire and I just want to jump in a mikvah for the rest of my life and never <laughs> hear another person speak again. But some of the worst things I've ever heard happened in the normal homes where it was all about externals and society. And what it did was it caused the internal to rot such that the internal was the internal was acting out in very vicious, cruel, and, and uh, horrific ways behind closed doors. And it's, it's, there's almost a correlation with it. Like, I don't want to, I'm saying almost because I'm being generous and especially because this goes live on, and it hits, it's also on Torny time and stuff, but they, they're pretty correlated, <laughs> pretty correlated. <laughs> there's correlation. Uh, which is really sad. Anyway, so so looking good for society is is a, is it's definitely a nuclear disaster. But guess what? You still haven't hit the main thing. Uh, you had one. There's there's what? Between the parents and the kid. Okay, you're saying something very deep, and that is that connection and comes connection comes from truth. Like, if you want to connect, you break a porcelain bowl and you want to reconnect it. So the pieces still have to click nicely. Otherwise, you're going to need sandpaper and, like, you know, real fine grit sandpaper to get them back together. So when you're, when you're pretending stuff, it's really hard to connect. So you're saying a deep thing. I don't think anyone would have thought of that except for you, of course. And, the, and then, <laughs> I don't actually know how she thinks, but I just gave her that. And the, um, anyway, but, the, but here's the big one. Ready for this? Drum roll. The children aren't safe. Your home, the address you're born in, has to be the safest place on earth because anything outside your home only gets worse, right? It might be safe out there, but it's not as safe as the home. Wherever is the safety of the home is how safe you're going to be in your world because things only get worse outside the home. Not saying you're outside the home is not safe. I believe it is safe, but it's not as safe as the home. Say, home's the number one nuclear safe place. Well, if parents are clearly just by their facial movements when they even look at a neighbor or speak at the Shabbos table about some group that's not your group or whatever, that, that all it takes is those little comments and those little facial movements or just kind of body language around people. And what it does is it lets the kids know <coughs> that ultimately that's not kosher out there, meaning that, whatever that was. And so, but the child's in there inside her own thoughts, inside his own thoughts, and thinking with all this, you know, the child's fantasies are wild. I mean, a person's, uh, adult's fantasies are wild, certainly a kid's fantasy. And they're, and they're just thinking of every possibility out there, and they all seem to be vulnerable, you know, they all seem to be viable possibilities when you're a kid. And then your parents start talking that way. And then all of a sudden you realize, wait a second, if they had any idea, if they had any idea what's in my heart. And you want to know something? Even if it wasn't in my heart. But the fact that I am capable of doing the wrong things and that that would finish me off, because kids aren't, kids aren't mature enough to know that your parents are going to love you anyway. They don't get that. So when parents start drawing lines like that, and they, and they show judgment out to the world, and they're not good at communicating that you're loved no matter what you do, so then all of a sudden you realize, it ain't safe here. This is why kids go off the derech. Why kids leave nice, observant Jewish homes and go out to the streets is because well, when you're out in the streets, everyone accepts everybody. I mean, that's the name of the game in the secular world is you're accepted no matter what. They're great at acceptance. So the kid goes out there for acceptance, but that, that's, you don't want your kids, you don't want your kids, you're on next, sorry, I'm, the class before me went real late, you, <laughs> <laughs> you finished at a quarter after, so the, we're, we're almost finished, the, um, 
You don't want your kids getting their nutrients at elsewhere. And the number one nutrient for every child is unconditional love. You don't use love as a gun. You don't hold it over their heads. It's not a gun, love. Love's one of the parts of God. It's one of those undefinable realities. That's one of the most precious things in the world. You don't use love as a gun for children's behavior. You make it real clear that they are unconditionally loved forever. You make your home the safest place so that maybe your kids will have some courage when they grow up. Because if your home's not safe, man, you're gonna be scared of everything. And I meet people all the time who are raised in the normal homes who are scared of everything. And they just can't even put one foot in front of the other. Make your home safe so that your kids will feel some safety outside the home. And maybe they'll be able to make a difference in this world someday, which takes a lot of courage. <laughs> Here I go again. That was today's session. And uh, anyway, it was great being with you all. I just want to tell you, this rabbi is an amazing rabbi. He brings money to a family every Thursday so they can buy Shabbos food. So if it folds, that's like chicken and fish. And if it jingles, it's drinks. But please, please, uh, this is your chance, end of the week, to lay it on them so that this family gets a good meal, okay, for Shabbos. Shalom, everybody.